We paused our first bars tour of Palm Beach County in the town of Boynton Beach, so let's pick up where we left off. We'll take you to this unique bar sitting in the middle of the intercoastal waterway right behind me. But it'll wait while we stop for a drink at a watering hole a few short blocks from here, the iconic Boynton treasure that is Hurricane Alley. The Brightline passenger trains pass nearby as they zoom north and south on rails that connect Miami to Orlando. We watch the trains fly by and then stroll less than a block to here. Hurricane Alley is an Ocean Avenue landmark and a magnet for a loyal posse of local fans, including us. Hurricane is in the bar's name and references to hurricanes are on the walls. It has that true sense of place that great bars have with historical photos of Old Boynton Beach and local nautical artifacts and paintings and even a caricature of a fondly remembered and years gone regular customer. We customarily schedule our attendance here to when we're likely to be greeted by Audra a congenial and crackerjack bartender and sovereign leader of lunchtime locals. All right, thanks. In fact, all the bartenders here are aces, and a key reason the alley is a meeting house where the local congregants gather regularly in fellowship and cocktails. For a neighborhood saloon, its kitchen is remarkably sophisticated. Oysters Rockefeller, Clamps Casino, Escargot, and everything is top notch. Its sandwiches have the names of hurricanes that have passed overhead in recent memory, and like hurricanes, the menu is divided into categories. When I find something I like, I tend to stick with it unwaveringly, and the fish and chips has long been my go-to. It's as big as your head. Anita favors the New England roll, but she's more gastronomically open-minded about what's for lunch. As the sea is a few blocks distant, seafood is fresh and artfully plated, and the raw bar is stocked. You know that big drip fishing boat, the Sea Mist, that I showed you in the first bars video? The one that docks in the marina by Two Georges? The co-owner of that boat is the husband of the owner of Hurricane Alley. And the kitchen here will serve you the fish you catch on the Sea Mist. It's a you hook em, we cook em deal. Hurricane Alley has an evolving selection of regional craft beers, including a nice Florida brewed, eponymously named Hurricane Alley Amber Ale. And when a draft pole is retired, it joins the retirement club. The outside tables along Ocean Avenue are dog friendly. And the menu includes them too. We have favorite spots at the bar, so we get there early for lunch, and then the rest of the bar stools and tables are populated in short order.
Hurricane Alley is also a backdrop to popular local events like Pirate Fest, which invades roundabout Halloween. From a rusticated local icon to a shiny new streamlined oasis, we move to Prime Catch, a few blocks away, and the Prime Island Bar surrounded on all sides by water. Another great place to share time with pals. There is more of a connection between Part 1's Banana Boat and Prime Catch than just a mile of waterway. Both bars are owned by the same family. This is where to sip boat drinks, like a Paloma, or a Dark and Stormy, or a Mojito, while watching the passing boat parade. Its food, too, is a cut above dive bar grub. Not that we ever turn our noses up at dive bar grub. Its next door neighbors are the new residents moving into the soaring towers, by Boynton Beach standards, of the Avion Riverwalk rental apartments. 2,400 to 5,000 a month. If you'd like to order the Prime Catch Black and Mahi with mashed potatoes and green beans every day, like I would. They have a big private deck up on the rooftop. Can you see the girls waving? If you were standing with those girls, this would be your lofty view of Prime Island down below. The inside of Prime Catch is upscale elegant and it has a nice upstairs for fancy gatherings. In bad weather or a rare winter cold snap, the indoor waterside bar is a fine refuge too. But on a splendid sunny day like today, everybody's outside. And this bar is open, but deserted. We have met our friendly and clever bartender, Stephanie, several times before this visit. And we told her we were making a video about the bars of Palm Beach County and ask her which bar she favors when she's not working, in case I should include it. And she thought about it, and answered quite genuinely that on her days off, of all the bars she knows, she comes to this one. And on a perfect day like today, you'd be compelled to say, I feel you, Stephanie. Another train, another bar. The Butcher and the Bar is across the street from Hurricane Alley and a half block closer to the train tracks. It's an interesting little pub that's a hybrid of food and beverage excellence. It is a butcher shop and a bar, or a bar and a butcher shop. The Butcher and the Bar may be a little hideaway, but Guy Fieri found it easily enough. And why wouldn't he, since he has a house like 16 minutes from here? 
The bar is Upscale Marble and Top Shelf Booze with some local beers like Copper Point Lager, my standby Boynton Brewery favorite. Don't know any other saloons hereabouts whose theme is meat cleavers. Its top shelf craft butcher shop makes the menu specials and the bar bites change all the time. The meats and the treats are sourced from local growers. Where else do you eat that tells you the names of the farms that raised your porchetta and your chicken meatballs and your cob salad? The owners had a brilliant idea to install an amazing wall-mounted vertical record player with classic vinyl albums as a jukebox. But there is limited use of it because of royalty issues for public play. Drat. So it's most often a wall hanging. But it is a work of art. And there are some interesting platters here. I donated these two. Eric owns the place. Speaking of interesting platters, the butcher shop and the clever chef turn out a photogenic gallery of ever-changing sandwiches, appetizers, and entrees. I'm a beer fan, but others have said Butcher in the Bar is tops for unique boozy drinks. That's Chris behind the bar. He's an engaging raconteur. On this day, the bar has a bottle of Old Rip Van Winkle, whose label proclaims it to be 10 summers old, which will cost you $100 for a sipper. Not to be confused with Van Winkle Special Reserve 12-year-old Lot B, which costs $110 a drink. These are relatives of the legendary Pappy Van Winkle, 20-year-old, which is priced like a lightly used 2017 Harley-Davidson street rod or a 98-inch QLED smart TV with soundbar. Time to move again, this time two miles west, to a very interesting and cozy saloon facing Boynton Beach Boulevard, named, for some reason, The Boulevard. Danny, the affable partner and manager of the boulevard, raises the wide door of the bar at 11 o'clock and it stays open till 2 in the morning. At night, the place is packed with sports fans and live music lovers, but we are day drinkers and for purposes of bending an elbow, we appreciate some elbow room. The concept of the colorful bar, one of the newest around here, strikes first timers with its originality, dead rock stars. Its slogan is, Till Death Do Us Party, and the walls pay tribute to famous faces who left the stage way before their times. I won't recite the names, but you know who they are. Mostly from their music, but a few from the movies, like James Dean. On another wall, paintings of music icons who all died at the same age. Far from being creepy, it feels like a cool tribute to tragic heroes of pop culture who paid the ultimate price for their authentic lifestyles. Many of those on the walls OD'd, but some died early from illnesses or accidents. Anyway, you can spend some time lifting a glass at the bar to the memory of someone in the iconic gallery you remember with fondness. The bartenders are friendly, funny, fast, and efficient. Katie is behind the bar here not to be mistaken for this Katie behind the bar. There are three Katies in the rotation currently. The big open door lets in the light and gives a sort of open air feeling to the big bar. The menu is long on comfort food. Danny showed us some new additions to the walls, artworks by a local artist by the name of Lisa Bellavance, who creates portraits of pop stars incorporating the recording tape that's pulled from their cassette tapes. Cool, huh? Bob Marley right here. Amy Winehouse. Yeah. 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 Kurt Cobain. 
And, of course, these artists, decorated with their own music on tape, are also deceased, with the exception of the one hanging over the door to the kitchen, who is an exception to the rule because, well, obviously, because she's Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is the only famous musical artist on the walls of the boulevard who remains alive. Knock on wood. May she live a hundred years. Anyhow, the boulevard is a great addition to the Boynton Beach bar scene, if bars where you can find me can truly be called a scene. It's a nice place to hang, whether you have two legs or four. Hey, what's that sound? Another train. Another bar. Entering Delray Beach, home of Saltwater Brewery. Saltwater is one of several great breweries hereabouts. Maybe we'll do a brewery tour sometime, but consider this a fine representative. On this day, we arrive early because it's Father's Day, and dads will be dragging their families here soon. Dads themselves don't actually need to be dragged here. Take it from me. Michelle is behind the bar. Behind her is the big screen of craft beer choices and windows through which one can see the gleaming stainless steel tanks where the magic happens. Should parents bring their kids to a brewery on Father's Day? Only if they wish to raise their kids right. As CSNY said best, raise your children well. A sign on the fence says, beware of trains. But it should say, be aware of trains because they're fun to see zoom by. If there's anything to be aware of at Saltwater, it's the beer called Don't Get Confused. It's 11% alcohol by volume. Saltwater's Reef Room, the indoor bar, is a gathering place. When Anita retired, her party was here. The menu changes with the arrival of the latest food truck. Today, it's Cousin's Main Lobster. Overstuffed lobster rolls. Here's the truck on another day. Chicago Me Up. Anita and I moved here from Chicago, and this truck does serve authentic Chicago Italian beef sandwiches with hot jardinera and Italian sausage and hot dogs, which are perfect for today when the bar's TV displays the Chicago Cubs playing in London, England against the St. Louis Cardinals. Anita insisted on taking a picture of me at the bar because she complains I'm never in pictures because I'm taking the pictures. Now, who's up for Mexican? One mile east from Saltwater Brewery, still on Atlantic Avenue, is Rocco's Tacos. Delray is famous for its downtown Main Street with bars and restaurants lining more than a mile of Atlantic Avenue. You could make a bars video three times longer than this one and not include them all. Anyway, Rocco's started the upscale Mexican movement hereabouts. Anita and I were once assigned to travel to the Mexican city of Tequila in Jalisco State and write about making tequila. I know, right? This is me outside the oldest bar in Tequila. This is me inside the oldest bar in Tequila. And the bartender schooled me in crafting tequila cocktails. This is a cow I met in tequila. Anyhow, we knew nothing about tequila before our trip. 
And so we came here to Rocco's in Delray to enroll in tequila school to learn from the Jedi Masters of Blue Agave, scientific name Agave Tequilana, who reside behind this bar. Back then, the bartender suggested a flight of Herradura, and we consumed the entire curriculum of Blanco, Reposado, Anejo, and Extra Anejo, which describes their different ages and pampering. Mind you, this was at 11 o'clock in the morning. Rocco's tequila menu is long. The list of tequilas alphabetically from Ambar to Zignum total 270 total. Reposados alone number more than 70. Of all these tequilas, I've now tasted upwards of 50. And now I order the one I like best, which is Casamigos Reposado, because it turns out that George Clooney and I have the same taste in tequila. So I got that going for me. Rocco's interior is classy and cool. A rustic sign behind the bar advertises a local Mexican himador. He's the farmer who harvests the agave to distill into tequila. He cuts off the sharp fleshy leaves with a razor sharp blade at the end of a long handle and this is a tool called a koa. The piña inside gets its name because it resembles a pineapple and can weigh a hundred pounds and more for crying out loud. It takes 15 pounds to make a bottle. One more reason to sip a good tequila slowly. Enough tequila in Mexico. Let's get back to tequila in Delray Beach. Some Rocco's bottles on display are nearly museum quality art glass. That's why some bottles sell for more than a center floor ticket to Taylor Swift, who I guess is still on my mind from her portrait at the boulevard. The bartenders are amiable and fun and we include some of them among our Facebook friends, as we do dozens of great bartenders across this great land of ours or more specifically, this great land of bars. We love Mexican food, and no two places make it the same, but we rate Rocco's aces. By the way, when you hit the men's room, you might catch a little of the excellent Mexican Day of the Dead movie, Coco. Now, who's up for more Mexican? Just a half block walk from Rocco's is El Camino, another great bar whose theme is south of the border. And I don't just mean south of the border between Boynton and Delray. One reason we come here is that El Camino opens a half hour earlier than Rocco's. And Anita and I have always subscribed to the often repeated axiom that if it's right to do, it's wrong to wait. The bar extends nearly the length of a wall and right where it wraps around next to the open air sidewalk is where our two butts find familiar stools. If you visit on a Saturday, you may find the Delray Green Market in view. The tequila's menu is only slightly less daunting than Rocco's and adds to it an absurdly and seemingly endless menu of mezcals. A tequila price per shot ranges from $12 up to a Classe Azul Ultra Extra Anejo for $350. $350 for a single shot. Just a thing to celebrate your Powerball number coming in. With tons of tequila cocktail choices, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. In the food department, El Camino offers alternatives to Rocco's which are equally top-notch. It's a fine place to hang with old friends and to make friends with new tequilas. 
We are on the move again, walking east toward the ocean. Just before crossing the railroad tracks, the gates are lowered. So as long as we have to wait, perhaps 20 seconds, for the train to pass, we might as well duck into the nearest bar. We hit this bar less frequently than other places because we like to go early, and Vic and Angelo's doesn't open till mid-afternoon. Subject to change, consult your local listings. We do allow an exception to our early rule periodically, and we return here for two reasons. The first is, we like to watch trains. And I post a variation on the same video on Facebook every time we visit. There are also bar stools for you truly committed train fanatics who are tickled to see them fly by 15 feet in front of your face. The bar is nice and usually doesn't fill up till late afternoon. Vic and Angelo's has nice covered sidewalk tables for al fresco drinking during passing summer showers. I said there are two reasons we like it here. And the bar's other charm is its parm. The chicken parmesan is among our top three at the time of this visit, and it's plenty big enough to take half home for tomorrow. So as the passengers aboard the Brightline train disappear into the distance, so do we. Moving on to the beach. We've crossed over the railroad tracks and moved east to the ocean to the place that puts the beach in Delray Beach. Our destination is Sandbar. And this is the spot on the ocean side of the road called A1A that puts the sand in Sandbar. And a beach ball's throw across A1A is the bar part. The bar is super beachy with Bahamian colors and a weathered movie set background. Make up your own plot. Here's the Bacardi Rum Warehouse, so let's say we're in a seaside fishing village in Cuba. But wait, here's the Seaman's Club with the Welcome to Sailors sign in English. And so is the sign from Honest Mike, who has an interesting resume as a lawyer, a surveyor, a gynecologist, and a hotelier and the restrooms suggest a Pirates of the Caribbean vibe. So maybe we're in the English-speaking islands. Maybe Barbados or Jamaica, also famous for rum. Rum runners are on the menu. Bacardi, of course. We go early, as usual, so we don't see the place filled to capacity and with island music playing, but we like the sunshine, and you can see the ocean from here. The smiling servers are beachy too, like our friendly bartender Skyler, who remembers names and who drinks what. <laughs> We're here in October, so there are pumpkins. Before we leave, I must address the elephant in the room, which happens to be a shark. We have a history with the hanging shark. I think his epidermis began to shed in a hurricane some years back and his skin condition has worsened over time. Here he is long ago in his youthful prime and undamaged. And here you can see his tail paint has peeled away. During the pandemic his skin condition worsened to include a large splotch on his side. And most recently, his appearance has become a source of alarm to all those who knew him. At our most recent visit, he'd been taken away to rehab. 
and we are assured that he will return restored and revitalized. But here, I'll fix him in Photoshop. And this one too. All better. I should mention here that Florida has more than 1,300 miles of oceanfront coastline, and so it should be obvious that nobody has an exclusive copyright on the name Sandbar. And Google Maps shows a dozen from Orlando to the Keys. But our business here is the bars of Palm Beach County, so I am duty-bound to report that up in Jupiter, where we began the bar tour in part one, there is also a bar named Sandbar, a bar right on the sand. This little bar is part of the Jupiter Beach Resort and Spa, and could also be called the Pool Bar. So that's the other sandbar in this here county. Now, let's get back to where we left off in Delray Beach and the newest bar in town. Most bars in this tour we visited time and time again. But in our single visit here, we thought to make you aware of this because it starts out with a killer water view and it's Mexican. It's more accurately a Tex-Mex place opened by a guy who visits from the Northeast who is with a group that owns four of these places on Long Island. You can see the bar deck overlooking the Intracoastal Waterway. Some would say the jury's out on Del Fuego since it's so new. It opened in June of 2023 and this visit is three weeks after that. But if we are the jury, any charges brought against it are hereby dismissed. It has a great outside bar on the water, presided over by the excellent and engaging barman, Eloy. And a big inside bar for days when, outside, it's as hot as the hot sauce. And the staffers seem truly happy to be here. Del Fuego has Mexican and Texican staples and fun wall art. I don't know if you can make it out, but that small black and white photo shows a Mexican vaquero riding a juvenile T-Rex. So, that would be a Mex-Tex Rex. Our tour is leaving Delray Beach and heading south to Boca Raton, a town where one name appears on the most signage. Meisner Boulevard, Meisner Lane, Meisner Way, Meisner Place, Via Meisner, and even Meisner Bark Dog Park. Addison Meisner was the architect to the rich a century ago who created the pink Spanish Moorish castle mansions associated with Florida's Gilded Age. He was seldom seen without his constant companion, a spider monkey named Johnny Brown. Here they are together on a clock tower a few blocks from where we're heading. When Johnny Brown died in 1927, he was buried in a courtyard adjacent to Meisner's Palm Beach Mansion, a courtyard which is today a restaurant, and where you can find his forever home. Someday we'll take you to the bar in Delray Beach named for Johnny Brown the monkey, but not today because we're going to Meisner Park, home to a dozen fun bars and restaurants. And this one is Mexican. Okay, this is the last Mexican bar, I promise. And I don't know why South Florida loves Mexican like it does, but it does, and we do. Calaveras Cantina lives up to its name because Calaveras is Spanish for skulls. Skulls are everywhere. And Day of the Dead Katrina figures, looking festive in their well-dressed bones.
On the wall is a giant mural of the scene in the Quentin Tarantino vampire movie, Dust to Dawn, where Selma Hayek dances with a snake at a Mexican strip club. Interestingly, another Mexican connection to that movie is that it turned TV star George Clooney, five years on ER, into a movie star. And he later bought a house near Cabo San Lucas and founded the Casamigos brand of tequila with a pal of his, which is a popular sipper right here. On Cinco of May, the inside bar is packed. And so is the outside bar. It's a great bar and a great menu. And here's a sidewalk installation by a tequila company that will provide exercise as well as mix a margarita. Adios to Calaveras Cantina. And hello to a bar just across the square, maybe a football field away. Kapow is an Asian fusion noodle bar. Kapow is also fun to say. It's an onomatopoeic word. And Kapow is not shy about showcasing its comic book onomatopoeia origins. The walls surrounding the bar and tables are bright with eye candy. The changing video walls are spectacular and stunning. The Japanese motif bar and tabletops are fun to study. Our bartender Clarissa was fast and friendly and a blur behind the bar keeping up with a busy lunch crowd. Thanks very much. The comic book onomatopoeia slam bang kapow words jump out from the walls of the restroom and from the pillows on the cushioned benches. Biff, bong, boink, holy pokey bowl, Batman. It's got a wraparound patio for fun outside when it's nice out, which is most of the time. There's another Kapow noodle bar in downtown West Palm Beach, just a couple of doors away from O'Shea's Irish Pub. We go to the shiny newer one in Boca in the privileged company of our next door neighbors, whose son, full disclosure, is founder and co-owner of the place, for crying out loud. The food is unique and crazy popular, from the pork belly lollipops, to the KFC chicken bao bun, to the spicy skirt steak and noodles. And Kapow has three private karaoke rooms tucked away for people like this guy, laboring to stay on key. Blessedly sound insulated so as not to spoil the appetites of diners just outside. Great fun. Now, because all good things must come to an end, let's move on to our final bar, which is a movable feast of a bar because it's a bar that actually moves. In Bars Part 1, we found ourselves at Point Marina to experience two Georges and Banana Boat. But today's bar isn't on the water, like those two. It's actually on the water. A bar barge, if you will. Captain Dave is your designated driver, and before his cruise, he gasses up at the marina docks. Hello again, Captain Dave. <laughs> it has a bona fide bar abaft with bar stools. While Dave returns to park the bar, awaiting today's drinking crew, we can report that the bar serves an assortment of beers, 
Pinot, Cabernet, Chardonnay, Champagne, and Mimosas. And mixed drinks galore, handshaken with ice. Your friendly bartenders this day are Hannah and Luke. Oh look, the Sea Mist Drift Fishing Boat is right behind us, leaving the docks. We'll be racing it north. Eat before you cruise. You can order chips or pretzels, and I've seen some bring sandwiches aboard. Ten bucks buys you an hour cruise, and you don't have to get off when it returns. You can stay, no extra charge, for another ride, and another. There's a north ride and a south ride on the Intracoastal Waterway, and we manned our bar stools northbound. Master and Commander, Captain Dave, greets fans motoring past Banana Boat. Hello, Maddie. Hello, Dick. <laughs> the sea mist overtakes us straight away, proving that a proper charter fishing boat is always faster than a floating bar but its destination is the Atlantic Ocean, and we will wave goodbye as we pass the Boynton Inlet out to the sea. They call it uh, the inlet, but it also works as an outlet. Remember we dropped into two bars called Sandbar? Well, just inside the Boynton Inlet is an actual sandbar called Beer Can Island. There's an actual island with greenery, which is a no-trespassing bird sanctuary, but Beer Can Island refers to the dry sand, sometimes the size of a football field, where the boaters play. I must say that a very fun part of the whole floating bar trip are the tunes from the good speakers playing great reggae, Jimmy Buffett, and assorted southern rock classics, which of course I have to intentionally mute here and replace with a royalty-free selection. Otherwise, YouTube sends my video to the penalty box with a red flag, so apologies. It's nice to see a lot of prime real estate as we pass by. Lots of fun views without moving from our bar stools. People aboard boats often wave, because you got to admit, it's a novelty to pass a dive bar in your dive boat. And our skipper is the best dang bar driver in this county. And props, too, to Luke and Hannah. Up ahead, where the two shores come together at a bridge, is where we stopped in Bars Part 1 at Old Key Lime House. But we are halfway into this hour cruise, so we turn around before we get close. And as we head south, I'll just zip it and get out of the way so you can enjoy the view.
Sadly, this tour of bars has come to a close. Happily, all the bar stools await your own personal buttocks. And Anita and I will continue to add more bars to add to our collection, and who can say, when a part three might be in order. I will scroll the list of bars in part two on the other side of this 30 second pitch for a murder mystery I wrote set in Key West that also features some bars worth a visit. I hope you find all of this sufficiently entertaining to justify my intrusion into your digital personal space. The Town of Key West, a murder in a museum. Reporter Milo Bird reluctantly undertakes to discover a motive and slowly joins together puzzle pieces tracking back to the early days of sound recording and a long forgotten connection between Key West and Thomas Edison. Milo enlists his league of drinking buddies and together they unearth an astounding secret concealed since the time of prohibition. They race against unknown killers to be first to unearth a hidden object that has awaited discovery for nearly a century. New from Dave McBride and Palapa Press.